Uh, thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 9804 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme. I would ask any member who objects to say so now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 9804. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. The question is that motion 9804 be agreed. Are we all agreed? <coughs> thank you. Uh, now that the motion has agreed, uh, the nomination period for election of a member for appointment to the SPCB, the Parliament's corporate body, is now open. Nominations should be submitted to the parliamentary business team by 4.45pm today, and the election will take place just before decision time. We move on now to topical questions, and we start with question number one from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer, and I wish to wish one and all the very best for 2018. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the recent reported concerns regarding city region deals. Cabinet Secretary <coughs> Keith, Keith Brown. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Local Government and Communities Committee, I would thank Kenneth Gibson and his fellow members for the report, which is to be welcomed. Uh, I and the Scottish Government want to see all parts of Scotland thrive. City region deals are contributing to the same and importantly, they encourage the UK government to commit investment to the Scottish economy, which might not otherwise be forthcoming. In each of the city region deals that we have agreed, we have been clear that the deal must demonstrate benefit to the whole region, not just to the city involved. And that continues to be our approach for the remaining city region deals. They are, however, only one part of a much broader toolkit deployed by the Scottish government to foster growth in Scotland. The committee has made a series of important points, which I will carefully consider and respond to in due course. I hope I can rely on the UK government to do likewise. Uh, I think this was the first time in the Parliament's history both the UK and Scottish Government Minister appeared before a Parliament together. Um, so I would hope that we will see a response from the UK government to these points also. Uh, and I do agree, for example, that rigid demarcation of reserved and devolved deal components does limit the scope of a deal. City region deals are the product of negotiations between the Scottish and UK governments and they reflect the fact that the two governments have different economic strategies. In Scotland we want to promote growth which simultaneously tackles inequality because we believe that will create more sustainable benefit in the longer term. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I just agree the focus should be on what a project in a given deal can deliver. Now, he's just said, in actual fact, the Cabinet Secretary, whether a project is reserved or devolved should be irrelevant if we're to attract optimum levels of investment and deliver the best possible outcomes. Is that something which is happening at this time? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said in my evidence to the committee, the stipulation that uh, the UK Government will fund uh, only reserved uh, matters is something which the UK government themselves have introduced. They haven't stuck rigidly in all cases to that, and that wasn't the basis of, for example, the first deal in Scotland, which was the Glasgow City Region deal. But this is something that the UK government says it's important uh, to them to do, um, and we continue to discuss with them ways in which we can be more flexible. For example, whether uh, in a given area, and not all of these um, deals are restricted just, of course, to a city, but to a wider area, whether we can have a balance of regional and devolved issues uh, in different balances in different parts of the area involved, if that makes sense. So we have tried to be as flexible as we can possibly be. Uh, I do, of course, agree that projects with maximum impact are what we want to invest in. I've had discussions with the Secretary of State for Scotland, who acknowledges it would be helpful for local authorities and others involved in shaping deal propositions if the two governments were very clear in their resolve to work together in effective partnership. So I'm committed to doing that uh, and making sure that any obstacles to delivering for Scotland are removed. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that further answer. On the 22nd of November at committee, Lord Duncan gave heavy hints that the Chancellor that very budget day would announce funding for the Ayrshire growth deal. It did not happen. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my concern that foot dragging by the UK Government will lead to areas left behind being doubly disadvantaged by displacement of investment for example, Glasgow's deal has been up and running since 2014, where well, there is no date yet set for the commencement of Ayrshire's. And does he agree it's important to provide a clear timetable by which growth deals for areas such as Ayrshire will begin? Cabinet Secretary. I think as the member is aware, I have asked the UK Government in writing and verbally on a number of occasions to commit to an Ayrshire growth deal. And I've also publicly stated my intention, the Scottish Government's intention, to agree a growth deal for the Ayrshire's. 
and we will continue to encourage the UK government to support this, despite, uh, as the member hints at, uh, positive discussions at an earlier stage, no commitment has yet been made to an Ayrshire growth deal from the UK government. But we will continue to encourage the UK government to contribute to the regional economy of Ayrshire, whether that's through the UK's industrial strategy or other specific U UK government initiatives. Uh, but my uh, officials will continue to engage with the Ayrshire partners. We will see through a growth deal for Ayrshire. The best one would be one if we can do it in tandem with the UK government, but of course that is a decision for the UK government to take. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My constituents were disappointed that, unlike the UK Chancellor, Derek Mackay failed to even mention the Borderlands growth deal in his budget speech. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore reassure them that the Scottish Government is fully on board with this game-changing cross-border proposal and set out what specific resource is being committed? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, we've made substantial commitments in relation to the establishment of a new agency for the south of Scotland and borders has been part of a city deal already. So I don't accept the idea that we've not been proactive in making sure there's a deal for the borders. But it is important to take into account what's been just said by the previous member. The deal was meant to be on the cards for Ayrshire. What has happened to the Ayrshire growth deal? And why is Borderlands uh, now being spoken of ahead of the Ayrshire growth deal? I have said to the UK, uh, the Scottish Secretary of State, that I'm willing to work with them on a borderlands deal. But for example, my office was contacted this week, told that we would have, despite having agreed once again before Christmas, we'll work jointly and collaboratively together on this, that we should have a joint visit uh, later on this month. And it wasn't a discussion. He said, that's when we're going. Now he knows, he knows now certainly, that I cannot go on that day. I have a prior commitment with the Council of Economic Advisors. There is no alternative date. That's not joint working. That's not collaboration. I don't know whether it's game changing or game playing that's going on here, but we remain committed to working in relation to a borderlands deal. But let's be quite sincere and honest about this. What's happened to the Ayrshire growth deal? What's happened to Falkirk? What's happened to Murray? What's happened to the islands? These other parts of Scotland also deserve some recognition. And unlike the part of the country that Oliver Mundell represents, have not yet had a city deal. So let's be honest and sincere when we talk to people about this. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. One of the warnings given in the Local Government and Communities Committee report is that rural areas not covered by current city deals must not miss out or lose out against bigger cities. Now, Dumfries and Galloway is not covered by any city deal at the moment. Um, therefore, why has there been no meaningful, meaningful negotiations uh, involving the Scottish Government and indeed the UK Government with the five local authorities that actually cover the borderlands uh, area? When will we actually see those negotiations begin and see funding coming forward for specific projects? And given the committee's concern that local communities and businesses should be involved in shaping those projects, will you ensure there's an end to the current secrecy, secrecy that seems to exist at the moment that the projects that have been submitted to the government by the borderlands local authorities are somehow being held secret? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I don't know. You'd have to ask the councils about whether the projects that they've submitted are being kept secret or not. Um, but on the point about rural areas, now, first of all, it's worth saying that the city deals which have currently been agreed and the ones in prospect also include areas, my own, for example, which are semi-rural in nature. They're not part of a, a, a city area. And many of the city deals cover large parts of Scotland which are rural in nature. The point I'm making, I've tried to make it in response to Oliver Mundell's point, is we have to have an agreed process for how we're going forward. So whether it's Borderlands, whether it's the Ayrshire growth deal, whether it's to be Murray, who have also asked for a growth deal, whether it's to be Falkirk, who are not part of any current growth deal, or parts of uh, the islands of Scotland, for example, we have to have an agreed basis. Now, I will go ahead and we will make sure that all parts of Scotland, including Dumfries and Galloway, are covered by a growth deal. But we need to know whether the UK government's on board for that. So some clarity on that and what the basis of it is. Going back to the previous discussion, is it in the case that the UK government will only fund through industrial strategy? Do they want to continue to have joint deals with the Scottish Government? Are they going to be constrained in terms of only funding reserved issues? Of course, something they didn't do with the DUP when they put a billion and a half pounds towards something, all of which was devolved and not reserved. So we do have to have some clarity. There will be a deal for Dumfries and Galloway. I can assure the member of that. What we'd like to know is whether the UK government is on board for that deal and the others which we think should take place across Scotland. Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of my frustration that Fife Council did not include the Leave and Mouth Rail Link in their submission to the Edinburgh City Region deal. Uh, moving forward, however, will Fife Council have a future opportunity to re-evaluate their priorities and to submit the Leave and Rail Link for consideration? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, my understanding, uh, which I think the member will know better than me, is that the Transport Minister has given a commitment to further investigate the question of the Leavenmouth uh, Rail Link. But can I say more generally in terms of 
city deals which have already been struck being subsequently changed. Both myself and Lord Duncan have said to the city region areas which have city deals already that we are willing to look at potential changes. And Glasgow one is now three or four years old and it may be there's quite a lot changed, not least the, the prospect of Brexit in between times. We are willing to consider changes. What we will not be looking for are changes as to the relative distribution amongst the different parts of that area, so between different councils, or a change to the quantum of money being afforded both by the UK government and by the Scottish government. So of course, these deals last for a long time and we can't constrain uh, uh, councils and other partners into a 15, sometimes 20 or 30 year deal staying the same right throughout. On the basis of what we've agreed and the amounts that we've considered, then we are willing to consider further changes in due course though. Claire Hockey. The Cathcan Relief Road in my constituency of Rutherglen was built using city deal funding of in excess of £20 million. Despite many of my constituents protesting the road was not needed and that its construction through a well park would destroy the habitat of many animals and plants, planning permission was granted by the previous South Lanarkshire Council Labour administration. What assurance can the Scottish Government give my constituents that their views will be taken into account and listened to in any future city deal projects? Well, can I say that in relation to the particular city deal which Claire Hockey raises, it is true to say that, of course, the Scottish Government wasn't involved in the early parts of that process. We were simply met with a demand from the UK Government and the constituent authorities uh, for funding of half a billion pounds, which we agreed uh, to do. And it is dependent upon the authorities and different partners to undertake that consultation to make sure they have uh, local populations on board. These are initiatives led by the local authorities and local partners. But I would just clarify to Claire Hockey that the city region deals don't over override existing processes. So local authorities will remain responsible for ensuring that proper consultation with communities and other interested stakeholders uh, is undertaken properly, especially when it's a statutory process uh, as these plans are developed. And of course, there were statutory processes involved in this particular uh, uh, circumstance in this particular project, but it is incumbent upon the local authorities to make sure those processes take place. Jamie Green. Thank you, presiding Officer. Um, I'm sure everyone in the chamber will join me in welcoming the £1 billion investment in Scotland that the UK Government has made through the city region deals. And I'm sure members will be pleased to know that I'll be meeting the Secretary of State for Scotland this Friday to discuss how we can move forward on the Ayrshire growth deal. But doesn't the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that uh, a potential compromise on objectives uh, uh, to alleviate any perceived tensions between London and Edinburgh is not just possible, but actually in the best interests of Scotland? Secretary. I do agree with the last point made by the member and all I can say is having asked any number of times both in writing and verbally to have a commitment to an Ayrshire growth deal way beyond that that's not discussing the projects or what the compromise might be on the projects or the amount of money being put towards it that's just discussing the principle surely that's got to be the starting point if I can get or if you can get when you meet with the Secretary of State later on this week a commitment to an Ayrshire growth deal that is the starting point and then we can, as we've done in each of the other city region deals, reach a compromise which will be to the benefit of all the constituent authorities. So I would wish the member luck in succeeding where I haven't so far in convincing the Secretary of State to make a commitment on behalf of the UK Government to an Ayrshire growth deal. Richard Lockhead. As the Cabinet Secretary has uh, mentioned a few times, Murray is developing its own growth deal in order to compete with Inverness, which is a city deal, and Aberdeen, which is a city deal uh, as well. Would he be willing to discuss with his UK counterparts how we can get more clarity from them as to what the UK contribution might be to a growth deal and also how we can expedite these plans? Cabinet Secretary. I think that is the key point that Richard Lockhead makes. If we have an agreed understanding of how we go forward from where we're currently at, having agreed the city deals that we have done, with the two more that are in prospect in terms of Stirling, Clipmanishire and Tay Cities. If we have an agreement now or shortly as to how we go to these other areas, Murray, Falkirk, Argyll and Butte, the Borderlands deal, if you can agree that, uh, then we can make rapid progress. But if we don't have an agreement, then the Scottish Government will have to take this forward itself. I think we can uh, get more out of it if we work together. So I'm more than willing to continue talking to the UK Government about that and, as a member has urged me to do in the past, continue to talk talking to Murray Council to talk about about their specific proposals. And question number two, Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the ruling of the recent employment tribunal in favour of the fingerprint officer Fiona McBride. Minister Annabel Ewing. 
Uh, this case has been running for many years, uh, indeed since the, uh, before the creation of Police Scotland uh, or the SPA. This is clearly a complex issue and I note uh, the latest employment tri tribunal ruling uh, uh, towards uh, the end of December of 2017 was made which has awarded Ms McBride compensation for her loss of earnings and pension contributions since 2007. It is for the SPA to consider its response to the ruling. Margaret Mitchell. Uh, I thank the, the Minister for that response. Can she confirm how much to date of taxpayers' money the SPSA and now the SPA has incurred in opposing Fiona McBride's reinstatement, given that the legal fees for the Supreme Court case alone amount to a staggering um, £257,120? Um, £120. Can um, she confirm who the SP is accountable uh, to for that expenditure and um, of this, the, the total amount of money? Minister. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't have uh, uh, before me the uh, uh, total figure uh, 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 as requested by uh, uh, the member uh, and uh, uh, that would be a matter uh, for the SBA. As I say, the SBA uh, is to consider this employment tribunal ruling uh, and it is uh, for them to do so. I understand actually that they are uh, in the process of making that consideration and therefore I, I do uh, recognise that there could be a risk perhaps that any uh, comment uh, on the decision uh, could uh, uh, trigger uh, to some extent some sub judice considerations. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you. Uh, does the cabinet, uh, does the, the minister consider it's, it's reasonable that as a consequence of the SPSA and then the SPA's refusal to accept the original tribunal decision in 2009, Fiona McBride has now had to wait 10 years for a definitive decision about her reinstatement. And it appears from what the minister has just said that even now, her position is still not certain. Minister. Uh, well, I, as I said in my uh, answer a moment ago, presiding officer, uh, it is for the SPA to consider uh, uh, this ruling of the Employment uh, Tribunal, which I think was communicated to it at the end of December of last year. Uh, and uh, as I also indicated, there is perhaps a risk uh, uh, in terms of making any substantive comment on the ruling at this stage that issues to an extent of sub judice could be uh, 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 triggered and therefore that would perhaps mitigate against myself as Minister doing so. Uh, thank you. That concludes topical questions. We'll move on now to